everywhere we would go, people would say, well, he was weird. He was, he was a weird guy. And it was like, he was a genius. Geniuses are weird. They're like artists. 18, 19, 20 year olds. They dream of travel, dream of finding their place, dream of making their mark on the world. This spring, a group of students will follow their dreams, walking in the footsteps of the most famous figure in their field, traveling to another continent and making unexpected connections between his legacy and their own lives and futures. of Isaac Newton from maybe kindergarten. Like teacher would talk about how an apple fell down to the ground and then Newton discovered gravity. An apple falling from a tree. A simple story, but one that has become the most remembered about Sir Isaac Newton. That legend can't begin to describe the immensity and the diversity of Newton's discoveries. So it means everything's true, everything's false. During spring term in England, this group of Hanover College students will trace Newton's life. Math professor Nancy Rogers will lead them to the question, what can be learned in following in the footsteps of one of the most intelligent human beings of all times? Newton is especially fascinating to us because he's a liberal arts person and we're a liberal arts college. Not only was he a physicist and mathematician, he was also an astronomer, a dedicated historian and theologian, an alchemist, and he was also a civil servant, an economist. And the seven students in my math history class have a combination of interest and double majors in math that uh, connect with Newton's wide range of interests. <laughs> Whenever I plan to teach math in high school, I want to be able to convey the ideas of Newton, and maybe give them a better appreciation because Math isn't always enjoyed by students in high school. This is the busiest time of the year for my family at home with my dad being on the farm. But he said he could manage it on his own this year. I feel bad leaving him with all the work to do by himself, but he's more than capable. Newton was actually more interested in theology than science and math from the number of papers that he wrote. Theology is very important in my life, and so it kind of helps me relate to him a little better to see that you can study both theology and math. Anytime there is an object in motion, or a collision, or any type of interaction between objects, Newton's laws of motion will be involved. We are going to Newton's farm. I was thinking if I were there and walk around, if. I could just hit by Apple or something like that, or just hit by some genius idea and then publish a paper. But I don't know if that's possible or not, but that would be cool if it happens. Adam Smith, he published The Wealth of Nations. And he is quoted or has you know, been sourced to say that Newton was one of his inspirations, the way that Newton would doggedly study something. I was interested in studying uh, optics, especially Newton's contributions, because of his revolutionary design for his telescope. Learning in the places that Newton studied will be pretty powerful because really it's going to be walking in the footsteps of a giant. We started out in Grantham, which is Newton's birthplace and boyhood home, and where he actually did a good portion of his physics work and development of calculus. It was cool to see kind of where his humble beginnings were as a farmer. To find that connection with him, kind of, oh, okay, he was a farm boy as well. There's a lot of different barns that they use for different things, some for the animals, some for storage, some for grain. So it was obviously a very big farm too. Newton was born prematurely in his mother's bedroom in 1642. His early years were marked by tragedy and loss. 
His father had died three months before his birth. Baby Isaac was not expected to live. At age three, his mother abandoned him. She married a vicar who didn't want the toddler in his house, and so Newton was left at Woolsthorpe with his grandmother. I guess being in his room felt, well, it felt very authentic, to say the least. The rumple bed, even the cat running around and sleeping on the bed. What was surprising about his house that I didn't expect to see was he had written out a list of sins that he had committed and in the same room where he was doing all of his scientific experiments. And so to see what he thought was important in his life and what he should and shouldn't be doing. Less than a half mile down the road is the parish church, which dates back to Saxon times, where Isaac was baptized and his parents are buried. I don't think very many people realize how important religion was to Newton. I think everyone focuses on his notion of gravity and they kind of forget about all of the other things that he did. that Newton's faith could have played a big part in his search for finding order in the world and finding truth because if he believed that God had created the world, it would make very logical sense to try to figure out how the world runs. Even at a young age, Newton showed a fascination with the effect of the heavens on the earth. A popular attraction at the church, graffiti, a sundial, carved by nine-year-old Isaac in stone. He loved sundials and watching the sun, and even in his later years in London, uh, he would walk into a room and look at the shadows, and he could tell you the time of day. Another place to find Newton graffiti, his old school in the town of Grantham. The library just used to be the school itself. Being in there and seeing his signature carved into the stone, it's hard to come up with the words that I felt while looking at all of that and thinking, here I am in England and Newton is all around me. Although Isaac was a bright boy, school would have been another rough start in life. Isaac was 12 when he began at King's School. Most boys came at age 8 or 9 and left by the time they were 15. Well, obviously he was at the school. Yeah. Yet modern day King's School Isaac pupils Newton. credit Isaac's difficulties with fueling his ambitions. They've even written a book of his life, which they presented to Hanover students. It's actually quite a, an incident that was quite famous, um, and where he had a fight with the schoolmaster's son in the churchyard. Took him over to the churchyard and rubbed his face in the church wall, which um, said to the bully that he was a coward. <clears throat> but he came back the next day and they were all sat in lines on the table and whoever was closest to the schoolmaster was um, higher up, at, like how clever they were. And Isaac was behind the bully. So from that day onwards, he decided he'd try and do as much research as possible. So he would be further up the table from the bully. And yeah. that's what really started off for him. And then he was never beaten in academics again. The boy's many stories make a young Newton real for these American pilgrims, as does seeing his notebooks and writings. Here's an inattentive scholar, but a boy full of curiosity. The chairwoman of King's School Parent Teacher Association fleshes out the boy's character. But he was, he was constantly doing experiments with all, all different things. And uh, he seemed as though that was his interest to do, uh, to try and work out how things happened or, or you know, how, how to make models. And he, it was, he was always very interested in that aspect. He made a lantern fastened to a kite, but the neighbours complained about it because they were frightened that it would fall on their roofs and set their houses on fire. As a little kid, I loved to tinker. I mean, he loved to tinker. He was making you know, windmills and sundials and all this. Um, I was building mini steam engines in my basement. There are a lot of original features in Grantham that are still here today from, that were here when Newton attended the school. The house where he lived was next to the George Hotel, which is still there. There's obviously St Wolfram's Church, which was there during his time. 
and there are, there's um, a couple of pubs which are nearby which were there when, when Newt was here. While at school, Isaac lodged in town with William Clark, an apothecary and an alchemist. He obviously would perform experiments which Newton was very interested in. A precursor to chemistry, alchemy involves searching for a means to create the philosopher's stone, a material that could turn metals to gold and bring youth, purity, and immortality to its user. Alchemy was kind of a secret thing. It's not something that people talk about. I mean, who would have thought that a man of science would have uh, kind of trifled in alchemy, which everyone claims and talks about as being a pseudoscience. But to him, it was, it was more of a real science, experimenting along those lines and pursuing his philosopher's stone, which kind of fell more into his theological backgrounds, aiming for moral excellence and the pursuit of immortality, really. It was said that the philosopher's stone could only be made by a person free of sin. And so for Newton, alchemy was another facet of his biblical studies. So he wanted to find the truth within the world, whereas the church was simply de dealing with spiritual aspects. So I think that he wanted them to go farther than they were going. They weren't explaining the world. They were just saying that God created it, and Newton thought that there was more to it than that, that God had created it to work in a certain way as well. By the time Newton finished King's School at age 17, he was the star pupil and well prepared for university at Cambridge. But Grantham and Woolsthorpe play much more of a role in Newton's career than that of his boyhood home. When Isaac graduated from Trinity College, Cambridge was shut down because of the plague, and so he had to return back to Woolsthorpe. His two years back had been described as the greatest achievement of a human intellect in a short period of time. He extended the binomial theorem. He invented calculus. He discovered the universal law of gravitation. In his spare time, he figured out that white light is composed of all colors. And all of this before he was 25 years old. It was almost a physics pilgrimage, if you will, going to the place where he really experimented and learn more about optics, especially his experiments with the light beam refraction. Through a slit in his bedroom window, Newton separated the colors in a beam of light. While outside, his apple orchard provided the legendary inspiration for the laws of gravity. I've always been curious about how little Newton, a little schoolboy, would come up with all those questions that we took for granted. Like, Gravity was always there, and you know, um, we don't know why he was the first one who questioned why apples fell down, not other directions. I guess we're kind of in the same boat, coming from being a farm boy that was homeschooled and then going into college, which is a different experience, but one that I quickly adapted to. It sounds like he adapted to it really quickly as well. And you walk past that gate and the gate closes and there's just this silence and it's really weird because the towns are this town's bustling on the other side but then there's this quiet and I was like you can feel the history it just it's just sitting there and you can feel it Cambridge University with a history dating back to the 13th century is one of the oldest universities in the world when Isaac Newton enrolled in Cambridge's Trinity College in 1661 he came disadvantaged, with only a limited knowledge of mathematics. During his first term, he bought a book on astrology, but he found he could not understand it because of the math. So he bought Euclid's Elements and Descartes' Geometry, and within a couple of years he had taught himself all the mathematics from the ancient Greeks to his own time. Newton lived in the apartment just to the left of the Great Gate, where he often worked around the clock. He would focus on a problem and become completely absorbed by it until he had found a solution, and then he would move on to something else. We did get to go into Newton's uh, uh, old laboratory, which is interesting, because it actually had a view of the bowling green. So he probably was you know, watching people bowl while you know, doing his alchemy experiments or whatever he was doing at the time. 
saying, oh, these guys are you know, wasting their time. Well, okay, I'm just going to stay here and do my experiments. Yeah, who knows? An artist and a genius, there's a social thing. They can't communicate with people the same way as the average person, so they throw themselves into their work because that's their way of getting their emotional outlet, their intellectual outlet. I was most inspired by his mathematics and just the power with which he attacked all of those problems and that he was going into areas that hadn't been discovered before. I didn't really know he developed cal calculus and stuff. We don't call the calculus with Newton's calculus as we call physics like Newton's law. And without calculus, we would not have had the Industrial Revolution nor any of the amazing technology that we have today. The Wren Library was constructed during Newton's time as university faculty. Now it contains some of his greatest works. In 1684, Edmund Halley, who discovered the famous comet, traveled to Cambridge to ask Newton for help on solving the problem of why planets travel in elliptic orbits about the sun. And Newton told him that he had already solved the problem. When Halley read his nine-page paper, he knew that this would cause a scientific revolution. Newton didn't want to publish his work. But Halley urged him to and offered to pay for it. Two years later, the Principia was published. I'd say we go this way. Yeah. <laughs> Plunging on the river is probably one of my favorite memories. Um, just because you know, going through you know Trinity College and you know under so many really cool stone uh, bridges and all that. Careful. It took a little while to uh, get the steering down on those boats on the punting because, I mean, all you have is this really long stick and not a rudder. <laughs> As the Hanover students glide along the River Cam, they get a chance to put into practice the laws of motion for which Newton is so famous, such as an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an external force. <laughs> It's hard to avoid the occasional crash when you don't have brakes. In punting, there's the whole equal and opposite reaction thing, because to do it, you push down on that big, long stick, and that's you pushing against, basically, the bottom of the canal bed, and then the canal bed pushes on the bottom of the stick, and it pushes on you, and there's the friction between your feet and the boat, and that winds up propelling you forward. <laughs> No matter what you're doing, you're generally doing Newton. Because Newton devoted so much study to his faith, following in Newton's footsteps means visiting Cambridge churches. At Great St. Mary's Church, a hike up the 123-foot medieval bell tower gives students a view of the entire city. while evensong service at King's College Chapel provides students with a sense of the traditional Anglican service. And at the Round Church, students learn how devotion to God forms the basis of the scientific quest to understand His creation. The big thing about the scientific revolution is why did it take place in Europe? Early in the Middle Ages, one could argue that China and India and the Middle East were ahead of Europe in science. It's a different from the Christian worldview in which God is separate from his creation, in which he has made us in a way that's like him to understand his creation and that it's okay to do so. The thing I really took away was how much Christianity spurred the development of the city, not only enabled but really pushed ahead the sciences and the mathematics. When you look at the buildings, some of the buildings here, the churches, they just blow you away with the architecture here and the way that people built those to glorify God and how much he meant to them to go through all the work and all that. Newton's own world began to open up on his return to Cambridge as a Trinity Fellow. 
Today, a cutting of his famous apple tree grows outside what once were Newton's quarters. During those years, Newton continued his studies on the nature of light. He found the colors inherent in light distorted the images and accuracy of telescopes. So he invented a new reflecting telescope. He did all of his work with mirrors instead of lenses, which uh, reduced the tendency to have a prism effect at the edge of each lens um, and gave him a sharper image. This revolutionary invention earned him election to the Fellowship of the Royal Society, ranking him among the most eminent scientists in the kingdom. We went to Grantham, which is a small town, and then we get to move to Cambridge, which is a little bit bigger, but still kind of a quiet setting. And then we got to go to London, which is very busy. And so it's kind of exciting to see where Newton lived and the different atmospheres that he was able to experience. After the publication of the Principia, Newton's fame grew, and along with it, his self-confidence. And he began, for the first time, to speak out on issues of concern. And in 1688, uh, his colleagues elected him to represent them in the Parliament in London. Because he had pursued this moral excellence, now it was his turn to help the world pursue its moral excellence. The Hanover students find a city filled with mementos of Newton's presence. Newton, the renowned intellectual, the government representative, a leading national figure, and then civil servant as Newton is awarded the post of Warden of the Royal Mint, which was then housed in the Tower of London. There was a, an entire floor in the central tower that was devoted to the Royal Mint and the different government offices that had been there. He worked as obsessively and as hard on reorganizing the Mint as he had done on math, physics, alchemy, theology, and all the other things. And uh, he completely changed it and helped to stabilize the economy because the currency was in danger of being devalued. And in 1705, he was awarded for his efforts by being knighted by Queen Anne. He was the master of the royal mint. He used to dress up as a commoner and he'd go down to the local pubs and just listen for anybody talking about counterfeiting. I am Isaac Newton and you are, you know, guilty of crimes against the crown and all that jazz. And so I thought that was kind of cool. In order to develop our understanding of how mathematics had developed up into Newton's time, we spent two days at the British Museum. All like our our stuffs are just come from the old people, so you really appreciate how much effort they have done to make whatever the research I can do today possible. So many civilizations rose and fell and pursued mathematics to, to a great extent. I mean. Uh, solving quadratic equations and cubes and all these uh, equations that you know, give us a little bit of trouble today. The final step in tracing Newton's life means a pilgrimage to Westminster Abbey. For a thousand years, the coronation site of kings and the burial place of England's great. When we went to Westminster and we got to actually go see his tomb and to actually go behind the red tape, and to touch his, you know, touch his casket and see where he was buried. That was probably the most surreal moment. Standing there and knowing that there was so much history and so many people that you know, had, come, had come before us. He really worked his way up in society from starting out very low and he worked his way all the way up to the top because that's where all the kings and queens are all buried. So to see that in his grave stone is it's very large and in a very prominent position within the Abbey. For the Hanover College students, it's a place to reflect upon mortality and upon making their own mark on history. To realize that studying Newton is not to study physics or math, theology, economics or chemistry, but to study the connections between them all and the material as method of the divine. The favorite part was definitely actually being able to touch it, looking because it had inscriptions of all the different things that he did, from you know, optics to alchemy to uh, working in the Royal Mint. 
there are the telescope, um, the coins, and it's just all the stuff he have he has done. And then you really appreciate he is such a genius. He has done so much in this world, and this is not going. I mean, this world is not going to be the way it is without him. He didn't just have a set of axioms and assume that the everything about the world could be derived from there. He actually tried to see what happens in the world. Which could be considered that he'd finally found the Philosopher's Stone because it did change the world and it gave him immortality. But when we visit all the places that he lived and that he was working at, then you kind of get to see that human side of him and see that he's kind of just like everyone else. I mean, he's a genius, but the fact that he's not so much different and he struggles with some of the same things and he wasn't sure of himself and his work, he was just like the rest of us. The trip to England has definitely inspired me. I've always loved math, and now that I've been here and I've learned even more than I thought I could, and seeing all of this, not both math and just history itself, like live, in person, that just makes me want to learn even more and see even more back at home and around the world. The whole trip we surrounded ourselves with works of great people when we went to the museums and all the great pieces of literature that we saw dating back to the third, fourth, fifth centuries and all the great instruments that were made to discover all this math. And it did really make me sit down and wonder, you know, these people were just like me. They were just human beings and they had far less resources when they came up with their ideas than we have now. I think it, it gave me some more motivation to keep working, to keep seeing what I can achieve. I can certainly put more work and try and reach a higher bar than maybe I thought I could before the trip. I can't even begin to talk about England. I get too excited. Basically, I was surprised at how different the culture was. We went there to do this documentary on the, on the students and I think I was learning while learning while learning. It's just like a continuous process. Aside from learning all of the documentary stuff, like being thrown in, just, you know, having a camera, going out and doing everything, I just learned so much about the history of England, you know, getting along with people, just too much to even start. 